Lord, we do pray for those who are working in the fields, um, Lord, that you would keep them safe. We think of those here in our, in our congregation and our friends and family, Lord, that uh, we do pray for safety. We are um, grateful, Lord, for uh, your word. We're thankful that we can gather together um, freely uh, in our nation to, um, uh, to, to worship you, that we can come together that we can carry our Bibles, that we can sing, that we can do all of these things, um, publicly put a sign out front, say that we are a Christian church. Uh, Lord, we, don't take, we, we do take those for granted, but I pray that we would not. As our brothers and sisters around the world, many are not able to do this. And so we pray, um, Lord, that we would come with hearts of gratefulness and thanksgiving, not only for our freedoms, but especially because of the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. Lord, I pray that you give us wisdom today. Help us to understand um, the things of your word. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so uh, we have been, I've got a couple things that I want to talk about this morning. We're talking about um, uh, one of my thesis statements as we've been working through this is that the um, secularization or paganization of our society our country, the West, however you want to put it, is more demonic than we realize. And we're talking about these old gods. And so when I say old gods, I mean these, these gods from the Old Testament that, are, that, are, um, that keep coming back. And um, sometimes we think of these gods as being uh, non-existent, uh, like, uh, like an idol, like it's just a piece of stone or just a piece of wood. Um, but we know that there are demons. We know that there is a spirit world. We know um, from Ephesians especially, but uh, various places in the New Testament, that there are principalities and powers um, that we are um, in war against, right? For spiritual warfare. And so um, we want to talk about this. And so last week we talked about um, Baal or Baal, however you want to say it. And um, uh, in, in Canaanite lore, so do you remember what the word Baal means? It, it means owner or lord, okay? So, so several different cultures would use that word, um, different, like, so especially in Canaan, especially in the ancient world, um, city-states, right? Think of that, right? So um, you have these, these common languages sometimes or common dialects in the same languages and they would use the word Baal. And so you see it throughout the history of the scriptures where it's used and it might be a local God, but it's the same word. I'm, my argument is I think it's actually the same spiritual entity behind it. Even if that local God has some different characteristics, so, so the, um, the, the, the Hittites might use uh, the word Baal to be one of their gods, and he might have some characteristics, whereas the Jebusites would also use the same word. He might have a little bit different characteristics, but same, we're talking the same entity, the same um, uh, demonic forces behind it. And, and so then we see this even in, in throughout history when we get past the, the history of the Bible. Um, I, I would argue um, uh, that, that Baal is the same God, the, the spirit behind Baal is the same entity as Zeus, Jupiter, um, Thor in Iceland. And did you know, I think um, Dale Keller brought this up when he was talking about Iceland the rise in, um, in the Nordic uh, false religions, the, 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 the rise in the worship of Thor. Do you remember him saying that? That that's actually getting more and more common? Um, and, and if you, you're going to actually think you're going to start seeing that more and more, even in just general <clears throat> news reports and stuff where you'll see the Icelandic, not, not only Iceland, but especially those Nordic North countries of Europe um, getting more and more into um, really these old gods just becoming more and more uh, prevalent again. Um, so there's one other characteristic, and I want to move into the Ashtoreth or Ashtoreth um, here, 
Uh, that is that, that Thor is, I mean, Thor or Baal, whichever, one of these old gods, um, is often seen as the sun god, okay? So he is often the sun god, but that's not exclusive. Um, sometimes he was actually the moon god, but a god of a, of a, of a, a heavenly body, okay? So um, he was the sun god or the moon god. And, and the reason I'm saying sometimes the moon god is because there's actually, I want to circle back now to a question that Lee asked last week about Allah and Islam. And um, I didn't, I, did, I, I don't remember what my answer was, but I didn't make the connection. Let's make that connection right now. <laughs> <clears throat> so there is hard evidence, even archaeological evidence, that the god Allah is an ancient pagan deity. Um, in fact, uh, you, can, you can do, there's a lot of archaeology that has happened, and of course, we have to be, you have to be careful when you're reading things online, right? You, you know that. <laughs> um, but there are, there are political agendas behind what's published, and so sometimes you have to look at the less than mainstream, right? Um, because the, 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 the talking points right now is that Islam is a peaceful religion. Friday was the day of jihad or whatever. It was a bust, <laughs> but it, that's what it was, right? It's not a peaceful religion. A peace of religion according to... Yeah, yeah, and that's where I'm going to go. The ones who actually hold to what the Koran says, um, who, who would be um, the fundamentalists, those who strictly interpret what the Koran says, are the ones that... That's, this is the Taliban and the Ayatollah and, and these really strict Muslim nations. What they're doing is what their scripture says to do. Um, so, so let's talk about this here. The reason that I'm saying about the sun god and the moon god, what is, um, uh, on, the, on the banks of the Nile, for example, um, and even in, in Turkey and throughout the Middle East, archaeologists have uncovered some temples or ruins um, where they have found um, uh, what they believe are temples to these ancient, this, this ancient god, um, so, so the Assyrians, the Babylonians, and the Akkadians took the word, the word is, um, in English, we've translated it to suen, S-U-E-N, and they've transformed it, this is the irony of ironies here, I think, they've transformed it into the word S-I-N, <laughs> sin, and, and so this is their favorite name for a moon god, sin, okay? That's a great an easy thing to remember, okay? This is one of the ancient chief gods of both the Assyrians, Babylonians, and Akkadians. In ancient Syria and in um, uh, Canaan, so, so think the Middle East, right, where Israel is today. In ancient Syria and Canaan, this moon god Sin was usually represented by the moon in its crescent phase, what does that remind you of? Yeah, so even the Red Cross, the Islamic version of the Red Cross is what? The Red Crescent. Th that, that image of the Crescent has always been prevalent in Islam, and it finds its roots way back in ancient Syria and um, Canaan, especially in this moon god Sin, um, uh, sometimes they, in some of the archaeological digs they found a full moon that was placed inside a crescent moon to emphasize the phases of the moon uh, uh, because this is part of their worship. Um, this, this god, Sin, um, he, was a, he was a judge of men and the judge of gods. Okay? So he was the, the, the high, he was the sort of the antithesis to Yahweh. He was the, um, the opposite of Yahweh, okay? So he was the false um, being that was at odds with the God of the Israelites, okay? 
So the Old Testament is consistently rebuking the worship of this false god, and, and, and usually it's translated Baal. But it's the same, we're talking about the same God. This is the God that was prevalent, archaeology shows was prevalent in this time. <clears throat> and when Israel fell into idolatry, we, we kind of looked at this, and, and we're, and we're going to look at this some more. Um, it was usually into this cult of this moon god. Um, <clears throat> and, and throughout the ancient world, this symbol of the crescent moon can be found on um, on various uh, uh, seal impressions and steels and, and pottery and amulets and clay tablets, um, all, all kinds of things. They found this image. Now, fun fact there, and, and it's more than just simply they found this image, okay? Um, it, it's more than just simply, oh, they use the moon, Islam uses the moon, it must be the same God. It's more than just that. Um, but here's a little fun fact I want to... I wanna, throw in here um, there was a there was a city um, in uh, what was then called Ka uh, the the Chaldees the people were the Chaldees that later becomes the Babylonians um, there was a city and that was the city was the sort of the um, the high um, center for worship there was a temple there in this city this city was known as Ur does that ring a bell? Ab right. Abram was called out of Ur of the Chaldeans. He was called out of the city to go to the land that I will show you. The city that he was called out from was the city that, where there was, a, there was a high temple. It was like Mecca, if you will, of Baal worship. Okay? That's where he was called out from. Keep that in mind in the sermon later because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to reference that, but I'm not going to really go into it, so hopefully your light bulbs will go off when I say that later. I should be able to see it in your eyes. <laughs> um, so, so uh, and, and um, Abram's father was a high priest uh, in that cult, likely. Now, this, uh, I'm going to read several um, characteristics that should make us think of our society today, um, of uh, the ancient world that the, even especially in the time of judges when every man did what is right in his own eyes, um, we see several of these things in, uh, so in judges, in the books of the kings especially, okay, first and second kings. These are characteristics that are taken out of the Quran. So people who are, um, who hold tightly to the Quran, the ones who are most adamant about it, okay? Um, these are characteristics of this religion. Pedophilia is taught in Islam and, and was practiced by Muhammad, okay? Um, here's another, this is sort of a, 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 a rule. Raping a slave or captive girls is permitted in Islam even if they're married to pagans. So r rape is permitted. W what are we seeing on the news that has happened in Israel? We're, we're seeing all of these things being perpetuated, right? It, it's worse than that. There's all kinds of violence, but these things are being perpetuated. Selling of servants for sex is allowed by Allah and Muhammad in the Quran. Okay? Uh, necrophilia was taught and practiced by Muhammad. That's sex with dead, dead bodies. Um, bestiality and sodomy are allowed in the Quran, in Islam. Polygamy is allowed and um, more than allowed. And so you see this in these most primitive like Afghanistan, Iran in particular right now, but all through Islam, you're seeing these things are actually a part of this. Um, according to the Quran, Allah authorized Muhammad to marry his daughter-in-law. Okay? Um, Allah closely guarded, um, this actually is, this is probably the one that you know. Um, 
He closely guarded virgin sex slaves in his pavilion in the afterlife, paradise, for jihadists to enjoy. That's one of the reasons why jihadists will do what they do, right? That, that, that they, you know, suicide bombers or whatever, that they get ten virgins in, in their paradise. Um, the, the list kind of can go on, but you get the idea. Immorality is rampant in this. And, and so what we're seeing in our society, in a lot of ways, isn't as bad as this yet, but it is certainly getting there. In fact, I would say that one of the ways it's getting there is that all of those things are celebrated in pornography in one way or another. That desensitizes the American mind to the brutality of some of these things, right? So that, so that now, like if you think even... Um, uh, 2023 versus like whatever 1983 the the stuff in society that is acceptable now that was not acceptable even 30 years ago 1983 is 40 years ago sorry um, e even those things that are acceptable now that weren't acceptable then it a lot of the reason is that is because of pornography but actually it's more than just simply pornography it's also like the entertainment culture, which is all connected to this, right? <clears throat> so I wanted to make uh, those things clear that um, it, it, if uh, Allah, the, the, the spiritual forces of evil behind this being Allah, okay? He, when we say he is not God, there are people who believe that Jews, Christians, and Muslims all worship the same God. That is not true. That is emphatically not true. This God, lowercase g, Allah, is satanic and is opposed to everything that God, Yahweh, um, is for, right? All the good gifts that he has given to his people. You have a God that is bent on destruction versus a God who is mighty to save, okay? Okay? Questions or comments on all of that? Yeah. Yeah, Jesus talks about suffering, right? That, that we will suffer, that we will be persecuted for the sake of the name. So one of the reasons that I'm beginning in, I, I think, beginning in January, um, I'm going to start in First and, and then Second Thessalonians and then the book of Revelation, is because those, those books, those letters, um, uh, Revelation, not really, it's kind of a letter, there's letters involved in it, but those books are given to the church to encourage the church. Um, and so we, we need to be encouraged even when we look at the news and see terrible things happening around the world or when terrible things happen in our own family. We need to hold fast to the encouragement that we find in God's word, um, knowing that, that however we interpret those books, and, and we in this room interpret them in lots of different ways, however we, especially uh, Revelation, however we interpret those things, they are given for the encouragement and and. Um, the steadfastness of the church. And so the goal, my goal as we work through this next year is that we would remain steadfast and we would not be people who are just, just downbeaten and discouraged, but that we would be a people who are just encouraged that, that God is who he says he is and that his word will come to pass. Um, his promises will be made will be fulfilled, and all of the promises of God find their yes in Jesus Christ. So, so we're, we're going to go there. Um, 
I know there's a lot of discussion about um, Israel right now and Palestine and the wars and all of that that's going on there. And, you know, I, the news broke, it was last week, and I was almost like, oh, man, couldn't they just wait another year when we're into the middle of this? <laughs> that's my selfishness, sorry. Um, yeah, so uh, we need to be encouraged um, by God's word that we can, and, okay, so now I've just said, um, sort of o- opened a dark section of the Islamic religion, right? Say, this is what they're trying to do. This is what, this is what Satan is trying to do, the accuser. And, and one of the things that, is, that should be clear to us, okay, in, in 2020, the summer of 2020, what happened in the cities, especially around our nation and around the world? Riots, the, the, the Black Lives Matter riots. It was, right, it was proven now later that the organizers behind that group were grifters, right? They're buying mansions with the money that people are giving and all of that, okay? It's also known that that's a leftist organization, okay? The, the BLM organization is a leftist organization, and, and not all, this is where people can get... Um, uh, led astray, that a lot of the people who were out, the rioters, I'll stick with the, not necessarily the protesters, but those who were rioting, who were like in Minneapolis smashing up the the targets and stuff like that, going in and looting and all of that, those are, my my theory is, um, and I think it's more than a theory, those are the same people who are out now fighting for the Palestinian rights, and and there's there's geopolitical uh, issues that we could not talk about here all wrapped up in that but that it's the same kind of group and it makes no sense because um, hardline Muslims do not like the left wing and often one of the reasons one of the reasons when when people watch the news this happened a lot after 9-11 why do they hate us why do they hate us they hate us because of our decadence that's a lot of why they hate us they hate us, well, they hate us because we're not Muslim. That's why they hate us. But they hate us because of the decadence that they see that they're practicing behind closed doors within their religion. Um, those two groups, here's why I was saying that. Those two groups, the, the, the rioters of three years ago and the protesters of this weekend, are linked, but they actually should be opposed to each other. Right? Because the Palestinians are anti-Semitic at the core. They want Israel, thro- you know, the dead bodies thrown into the, into the Mediterranean. Right. They should be opposed to each other, but they're not. But this is what the, the, um, the accuser, who is the author of confusion, is trying to do. So he's leading gr- whole groups of people astray that sh- they, they should not be... Like, they shouldn't be working for the same cause, and they are because they're completely, their foolish minds are darkened. Does all that make sense? Okay, so we're getting a little bit off the topic here. Let's go back to, um, I actually want to get into, let me, let me read, um, uh, I want you to keep this in mind. Isaiah chapter 5, verses 20 and 21. This is a famous couple of verses. You're going to know this as soon as, I, you're going to, At least it'll be familiar as soon as I read this. But I want you to keep this in mind because we're seeing this all around the world and we're seeing this throughout the the scriptures. Isaiah chapter 5, just verses 20 and 21 says this, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and shrewd in their own sight. Okay? We're seeing that over and over and over again. Right? Those who are um, calling evil good and good evil. Okay, With that in mind, let's move to, we, we talked about Baal last week, I want to move to um, the second of the old gods, which is Ashtoreth. This, this Ashtoreth is, a, is the main um, female deity of, of the uh, both of the Phoenicians, which is, think down around Greece, and the, uh, Babylon. So Babylon is is a Iraq and Iran area. So in this Middle East, this is the main female deity. Remember, they have a pantheon of gods. 
Um, they, uh, God, Yahweh, um, created man in his image. Male and female, he created them. And um, uh, these worshipers of these pagans have created or come up with their own gods in their own image. And so they marry and they go to war with each other and uh, uh, ch- gods who are children rebel against their parents and all of those things, right? In the, in the pantheon of their gods. So the main female deity is Ashtoreth, also sometimes known as Ishtar or Aphrodite or Venus. These are all the same, I would argue, same as Baal and Thor and Zeus and Jupiter. The, it's the same spiritual entity behind all of this. Okay. Um, in in some cases, uh, so I said a female deity. Um, in some cases, this god is female, but often, now get this, often this god is presented as androgynous, or to use a modern phrase, gender fluid. Okay? That's often how this God is presented in, um, uh, in, in Scripture or in especially in um, the ancient uh, archaeological evidence that we've found. Um, but also, another interesting point, not only is this God um, either female or androgynous, is always on equal standing with the male gods. Okay? So it's never a um, a hierarchy or anything like that. It's always in, in equal standing with the male gods. The worship of this god included sexual immorality. If you remember when we read through, when we preached through 1 Corinthians, there were the temple prostitutes, and you will see in, throughout Scripture um, male and female prostitutes that were part of the worship. They were worked in the temple. And so part of their worship of this false god would be to go and visit these prostitutes. So worship included the sexual immorality, prostitution, divination, fortune-telling. Um, their, uh, their idols, so I don't know if I said this uh, last week, the idol for, like the, the carved image for Baal, do you remember what it was often? Yeah, often a bull, sometimes a ram, but often a bull, okay? Um, in in uh, the Ashtoreth, it's often a pole or a tree, a, a carved tree. Sometimes the tree is um, like, like the chainsaw carvers, that they take a tree and they chainsaw and carve it into something similar to that, or sometimes it's just simply a tree that they've planted in a specific place. It certainly has its roots there, yeah, yeah. Um, this is a, to put it gently, this is a phallic symbol, okay? Very specifically, this is a phallic symbol. Um, d- turn to Deuteronomy chapter 16. <clears throat> Deuteronomy 16 um, so uh, uh, Deuteronomy is, is essentially a, one of Moses' sermons, and he's, he's going over the law again, um, uh, preaching the law to the people um, before they, uh, when they're, it's at the end of his life and before they're entering into the promised land. So, so think um, 40-ish years after the book of Leviticus, same generation, Moses gets up and preaches the law so, so it's a restatement in many ways of the law of Leviticus. In Deuteronomy 16, verse 21, you shall not plant any tree as an Asherah beside the altar of the Lord your God that you shall make. And you shall not set up a pillar, a pole, which the Lord your God hates. Okay? So there's, there's two symbols. God is obviously not opposed to trees, this is a symbol that was used specifically for worship of this false god. They were prohibited from doing this. And yet, turn over to the book of Judges. So I hope you um, are catching the, as we've worked through Leviticus, and I've kind of referred to some of these things, the, sort of the timeline of 
Israel, right? So um, uh, Exodus chapter 20 all the way to Numbers chapter, I don't remember now, 10 or 12. Um, the, the people of Israel are at Mount Sinai. Then they leave, and you have a few chapters in Numbers where they're wandering the wilderness. They come to the, um, well, even before they wander, they come to the edge of the promised land. Um, they send in the spies. Uh, most of them come back. Ah, there's giants. Um, oh, I so badly want to get into that. We will. Um, actually, next week, I think. Next week, I think. Um, uh, and, and so in Joshua is the conquest, right? Moses dies, that generation dies. Joshua takes the next generation. They go into the promised land. It's allotted. But then Judges starts, and the Judges are those that have been appointed after Joshua, after they're settled. They've been given to the people of Israel to rule them, but it doesn't go well. And right in Judges chapter 2, verse 13, uh, let me read, um, I'll read this whole paragraph, starting in verse 11. You're gonna, this is a common phrase, especially in the books of Kings, the Kings and Chronicles. Um, and the people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, and they served the Baals. Notice the plural there. All of the lords or the owners or the false gods of the people around them. And they abandoned the Lord, the God of their fathers, who had brought them out of the land of Egypt. They went after other gods from among the gods of the peoples who were around them and bowed down to them. And they provoked the Lord to anger. And they abandoned the Lord and served the Baals and the Ashtaroth. There's the, this, this God that we're talking about here. These are often put together. The anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel and he gave them over to their plunderers who plundered them. And he sold them into the hand of their surrounding enemies so that they could no longer withstand their enemies. Whenever they marched out, the hand of the Lord was against them for harm as the Lord had warned and as the Lord had sworn to them and they were in terrible distress. Okay? So they worship both Baal and Ashtra and they put these poles up which are, which are sexual symbols. Okay? Turn over to chapter 6. I just want you to see uh, verse 25. This is the call of Gideon. Okay? So, Judges chapter 6, 25. Notice what the Lord says to Gideon. That night the Lord said to him, Take your father's bull and the second bull, seven years old, and pull down the altar of Baal that your father has, and cut down the Asherah that is beside it, and build an altar to the Lord your God on the top of the stronghold there, with stones laid in due order. Then take the second bull and offer it as a burnt offering in the wood of the Asherah that you shall cut down. So Gideon took ten men of his servants and did as the Lord had told him. But because he was too afraid of his family and the men of the town to do it by day, he did it by night. Picture the symbolism there. What does he do? Say, say it again. He uses a bull to destroy a bull, and then, he, and then he cuts the Asherah pole down, and so it was made out of wood, and he burns the wood and builds an altar to God on top of it. And he sacrifices the bull as the Lord commands. He does it at night because he's afraid. I actually don't, I don't know what I, what would I do, right? This is his dad's altar. God tells him, destroy it, tear it down, burn it, and make a sacrifice to me on top of it. There's a, there's a huge imagery there, right? We see this over and over and over again, whether it's the gods who, um, remember the god that, that fell down and hands broke, right? Dagon, right. Um, there's a lot of imagery in, in a lot of this. Now, <clears throat> turn to 1 Samuel. Um, I, I want you to see something very specific here. And then we're going to circle back to this next week because of Goliath. 1 Samuel 17. Yeah. No, go ahead. Mm-hmm. 
Mm-hmm. So, I, I, yeah, that's a great question because I'm, I'm actually, I'm, I'm planning either next week or the week after to go back and look at 1 Kings 18, which is Elijah and the prophets of Baal. And if Baal is a right, is a real spiritual entity, why did he not? Right, why did he not? You know, Elijah's down there mocking him. Maybe he's in the toilet. You know, like, why, why did he not? If, he, if there's really a spiritual and powerful being there, why did he not? Um, the, the quick answer is he's nothing compared to God. And that was what God was trying to get his people to see is that these, these spiritual forces of evil are nothing compared to God. And yet they do have power because we know that, for example, when um, in uh, uh, early Exodus when Moses and Aaron go in and they present their case to Pharaoh, who is the God of the Egyptians, let my, let my people go, Yahweh's people. It's a spiritual battle going on there. Um, the, the Moses's magi- I mean, uh, Pharaoh's magicians are able to replicate many of the miraculous signs that Aaron does because there's a spiritual battle, but, but only so far as God will allow them to, which, which fits in with the book of Job, right? When... Yeah, yeah, the, the evil, evil spirits behind these gods can only do what Yahweh will allow them to do. And so in, in the case of, we'll get into this in 1 Kings 18, in the case of Elijah, um, it, was, it was a show of force, 450 prophets of Baal, and there were, I can't remember, 200 or something um, um, prophets of the Asherah also there the emphasis focuses on Baal um, and they're doing all this stuff and they're they're trying to summon this God they're cutting themselves and and you know hour after hour and Elijah just mocks them the whole time because because they're nothing compared to Yahweh who immediately consumes even the dust it says the stones burn up like it's the comparison of the two um so, so we, I, I want, I'm glad that you pointed that out, and I want to come back to that. Um, but, but I want you to see along those lines the spiritual battle, okay? The, uh, we're going to look at chapter 17 and chapter 31. And I, I'm not going to read, it's, it's a long passage. So David and Goliath, and then chapter 31. Um, so maybe put your finger there, and we'll flip over to it. What I want you to notice is... Um, The word that I want to use, the word that I want to use is the anti antichrist, um, the anti savior. Okay, so if if David is a type of Christ, so if he is the one who will come a, as a type of Christ, I want you to see in chapter thirty one the attempted undoing. Okay, so the the anti savior. Um, so we know the the story of um, David and Goliath. What I want, let me, let me, um, I'm going to pick out a p- couple of passages to read. Um, let me pick it up in verse, so he's taunting, uh, Goliath is taunting. Let, let me read the first couple of verses here. Now the Philistines gathered their armies for battle and they were gathered at Soka, which belongs in, to Judah, and camped between Soka and Azekah, in Ephraim's Damim. And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered and encamped in the valley of Elah and drew up in line of battle against the Philistines. And the Philistines stood on the mountain on one side, Israel stood on the mountain on the other side with a valley between them. And there uh, came out from the camp of the Philistines a champion named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. And he had a helmet of bronze on his head and he was armed with a coat of mail. And the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze. And he had a bronze armor on his legs and a javelin of bronze slung between his shoulders. The shaft of his spear was like a weaver's beam. And his spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron. And his shield bearer went before him. 
He stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, Why have you come up to draw up for battle? Am I not a Philistine? Are you not servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourselves and let him come down to me. If he is able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But I will prevail against him and kill him, and you shall be our servants and serve us. And the Philistines said, I defy the ranks of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. And when Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Now, remember, the Philistines are worshipers of the Baals and the Asherah, okay? So this is a spiritual battle in their view. It's a physical battle as well, obviously. But in their view, Saul was a representative as the king. Saul was the representative of their God, Yahweh. So you have um, Goliath, representing their gods and clearly he's powerful he's big okay and he's taunting uh israel and in effect their god okay let's just keep reading david the son of um ephrathite of bethlehem in judah named uh David was the son of, uh, named Jesse. He had eight sons. In the days of Saul, the man was already old and advanced in years. The three oldest sons of Jesse had followed Saul into battle, and the names of these sons were born, uh, went to battle were Eliab the firstborn, next to him Abinadab, and the third was Shema. David was the youngest. The three eldest followed Saul, but David went back and forth from Saul to feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem. Oh, he's a shepherd. Okay. For 40 days, the Philistine came forward and took his stand morning and evening, 40 days, taunting them. The imagery here is that 40 days, Baal is out taunting Yahweh, worshipers of Yahweh. Let's see how powerful you are, okay? Jesse said to David, his son, take for your brothers an ephah of this parched grain, these 10 loaves, and carry them quickly to the, land, uh, to the camp to your brothers, and take these ten cheeses to the commander of their thousand. If your brothers are well, and bring some token from them. And Saul and and all the men of Israel were in the valley of Elah fighting with the Philistines. And David rose early in the morning and left the sheep and the keeper and took the provisions and went as Jesse had commanded him. And he came to the encampment as the host was going out to the battle line shouting the war cry. And Israel and the Philistines drew up for battle, army against army. And David left the things in charge of the keeper of the baggage and ran to the ranks and went and greeted his brothers. And as he talked with them, behold, the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, came up and out of the ranks of the Philistines and spoke the same words as before. And David heard them. All the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were much afraid. And the men of Israel said, Have you seen this man who has come up? Surely he has come up to defy Israel. And the king will enrich the man who kills him with great riches and will give him his daughter and make his father's house free in Israel. And David said to the men who stood by him, What shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? This is a great uh, that's a great insult, uh, uncircumcised Philistine. I just, that's a great insult. And the people answered him in the same way, so it shall be done to the man who kills him. Now El, uh, Eliab, the oldest brother, heard when he spoke to the men, and Eliab's anger was kindled against David and said, Why have you come down? And with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know your presumption and the evil of your heart that you have come down to see the battle. And David said, What have I done now? <laughs> this is a... Typical little brother, right? What have I done now? Was it not but a word? And he turned away from him toward another and spoke in the same way. And the people answered him again as before. And the words that David spoke were heard and repeated them before Saul, and he sent for him. And David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. And Saul said to David, You're not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him. You are but a youth, and he has been a man of war from his youth. But David said to Saul, your servant used to keep sheep for his father. And when there came a lion or a bear and took a lamb from the flock, I went after him and struck him and delivered it out of his mouth. If he arose against me, I caught him by his beard and struck him and killed him. He killed him with a punch in the face. That's awesome. Your servant has struck down both lions and bears, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be like one of them, for he has defied the armies of the living God. 
And David said, The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, Go, and the Lord be with you. Then David, uh, Saul clothed David with his armor. He put a helmet of bronze on his head, clothed him with a coat of mail, you know, chain mail, and David strapped his sword over his armor, and he tried to go, but he had, for he had not tested them. And David said to Saul, I cannot go with these, for I have not tested them. So David put them off, and he took his staff in his hand and chose five smooth stones from the brook and put them in his shepherd's pouch, his sling in his hand, and he approached the Philistine. And the Philistine moved forward and came near to David with his shield bearer in front of him. And when the Philistine looked and saw David, he disdained him, for he was but a youth, ruddy and handsome in appearance. And the Philistine said to David, Am I a dog that you have come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And the Philistine said to David, Come to me and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. Then David said to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword and with a spear and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you down and cut off your head. And I will give the dead bodies of the hosts of the Philistines this day to the birds of the air, to the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel, and that all this assembly may know that the Lord saves not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into your hand, our hand. When the Philistine arose and came and drew near to meet David, David ran quickly to the battle line to meet the Philistine. And David put his hand in his bag, took out a stone, and slung it and struck the Philistine on his forehead. And the stone sank into his forehead, and he fell on his face to the ground. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone and struck the Philistine and killed him. And there was no sword in the hand of David. And David ran and stood over the Philistine and took his sword and drew it out of its sheath and killed him and cut off his head with it. Then the Philistines, when the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they fled. And the men of Israel and Judah rose with a shout and pursued the Philistines as far as Gath and the gates of Ekron so that the wounded Philistines fell on the way from Sha'arim as far as Gath and Ekron. And the people of Israel came back from chasing the Philistines and they plundered their camp. And David took the head of the Philistine and brought it to Jerusalem, and he put his armor in his tent. And as soon as Saul, Saul saw David go out against the Philistine, he said to Abner, the commander of his army, Abner, whose son is this youth? And Abner said, as your soul lives, O king, I do not know. And the king said, inquire whose son the boy is. And as soon as David returned from the striking down of the Philistine, Abner took him and brought him before Saul, and with the head of the Philistine in his hand, and Saul said to him, Whose son are you, young man? And David answered, I am the son of your servant Jesse, the Bethlehemite. Um, David is the least of the least. Youngest son of Jesse of the youngest tribe, the youngest son of the tribes, uh, Bethlehem. Um, Bethlehem is, is nothing, right? W what is in Bethlehem? Okay, think about these things. If this is a spiritual battle, okay, um, he cuts off his head. The champion, that's a key word, right? The, the champion, um, uh, David is the champion for the Israelites in that sense. He's a picture of the one who will come, right? Turn over to chapter, oh my goodness, 31. I should, I, we should take the, sign, the clock right down. Chapter 31 now the Philistines were fighting against Israel. And the men of Israel fled before the Philistines and fell slain on Mount Gilboa. And the Philistines overtook Saul and his son, sons. And the Philistines struck down Jonathan and Abinadab and uh, uh, Malchishua, the sons of Saul. The battle pressed hard against Saul. And the archers found him, and he was badly wounded by the archers. Then Saul said to his armor bearer, Draw your sword. Thrust me through with it, lest these uncircumcised come and thrust me through and mistreat me. But his armor bearer would not, for he feared greatly. Therefore Saul took his own sword and fell on it. 
And when his armor bearer saw uh, that Saul was dead, he also fell on his sword and died with him. Thus Saul died and his three sons and his armor bearer and all his men on the same day together. And when the men of Israel who were on the other side of the valley and those beyond the Jordan saw that the men of Israel had fled and that Saul and his sons were dead, they abandoned their cities and fled and the Philistines came and lived in them. The next day, when the Philistines came to strip the slain, they found Saul and his three sons fallen on Mount Gilboa. And they, notice what they do here. This is the attempted undoing of what David had done, okay? They found Saul and his three sons fallen on Mount Gilboa They cut off his head, stripped off his armor, and sent messengers throughout the land of the Philistines to carry the good news to the house of their idols and to the people. And they put his armor in the temple of Ashtaroth, and they fastened his body on the wall of Bethshan. But when the inhabitants of Jabesh Gilead heard that the Philistines had done to Saul, all the valiant men arose and went all night and took the body of Saul and the bodies of his sons from the wall of Beth Shan, and they came to Jabesh and burned them there. And they took their bones and, and buried them under the tamarisk tree at Jabesh and fasted seven days. God's enemies here, this is the point of why I wanted to read all of that. I wanted us to see all of that together. God's enemies here, um, the, the, the disciples of Baal and Ashtra, they're defeated with by a, 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 um, the least of these, by a, a little shepherd boy with one shot. I don't know why he took five stones. He used one, and it sank deep into his forehead, and he fell dead, and he cut off the head of the enemy, right? He cut off the head of the champion, and then he brought it back to the king, which is an interesting picture. When they defeated, who would have been they thought the, the Israelites' champion, their king, okay, they cut off his head and tried to undo what was done in, in David. They tried to undo that. They, so they, they plundered them. They went and they took the land back. They're trying to undo that. What was their fundamental mistake? This is a weird place to end today. I'm, I'm sorry. But what was their fundamental mistake? <laughs> they got the wrong guy. They, they, yeah, that's actually a really good point. <laughs> they got the wrong guy. What, what was Saul? Do you remember uh, why they chose Saul to be king after all? Why the Israelites chose him? Yeah. He was the Goliath of the Israelites. He was the giant. He stood head and shoulders over everyone else. They wanted a giant like they had giants. So they went to cut off the head of that giant, but, but God said, you, you got the wrong guy. The seed, the promised Messiah, is coming through this short little guy, David. This, 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 this little teenager, however old he was. The shepherd. They tried to cut the head off of their, um, they tried to cut off their representative head and they, they got the wrong guy, right? God was working even in all of this. So that's kind of a weird place to end. We've got more to do as usual. We'll pick it up there next week. Let me pray. God, thank you. Um, thank you that, that Jesus is even more powerful than David, that David just is... Um, a a shadow of the Messiah. Lord, we thank you for Jesus Christ. I pray that we would hold fast to him and pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.